Hello friends, how you doing today? We are finished. All done. Knocking on Heaven's Door by Lisa Randall. This is the last video I'm going to make to cover it. We're covering chapters 19 to 22 and the conclusion today. Um, chapter 19 is called Inside Out. And it gives a great graphic on the size uh, going out into the universe. Most of the book was talking about subatomic particles, so going down into the tinier, tinier scales. And this chapter is talking about going up into outer space. So pretty cool graphic. Some of the information is trivial, but some of it is valuable in giving a greater understanding of our known reality. So for sure, uh, I'm thankful to have read the book. Um, if you do decide to get it and read it, it's it's probably got some good reference stuff in it. So it is worthwhile. I don't want to be too harsh on the um, author as I have in my previous videos. So would I recommend the book? On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd give it a 6 or a 7. So I'd have to say yes, it is valuable to have in your library just for the interesting references and, and the uh, the trivia and the, um, the the some of the details. For example, um, the, uh, the entire universe size, right? Um, they say that uh, they estimate it to be uh, 13 and three quarter billion years old, 13.75, not 76, not 74, 13.75 billion years old, plus or minus 200 million. They might be out by 200 million years. They don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty accurate, eh? And the way they determined that, um, they took a measurement of a galaxy that they knew was a million light years away. And then they measured the expansion. They said it was just expanding at 22 kilometers per second. So they just, you know, reverse extrapolate the measurement and you come down to when the universe had to have been all in one spot, right? And then you age it out accordingly and so on and so forth. It, they talk about the, um, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background radiation, right? CMB, cosmic microwave background radiation, and how that can give them details about the universe. And the, um, the COBE, which was launched in 1989, the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer. And um, they talk about the interesting concept of cosmological inflation. <clears throat> what that is, is how the universe expanded more rapidly at its uh, early stages than in later stages. And that's quite an interesting topic to, to, to get a little bit of a, a handle on. And so then we go to chapter 20. What's so large to you is so small to me. And um, chapter uh, 20 is talking about the relationship between particle physics and cosmology and how they kind of have a way of overlapping, uh, as I said, because on the one hand, they're using these particle accelerators to examine tiny, tiny particles. But at the other hand, these the discovery of these particles can relate to the um, overall characteristics of the cosmos. So you get a little bit of overlap there. And um, and that's talking about cosmological inflation in there, again, which is a very interesting topic. Um, it's interesting because they're talking about dark matter. What dark matter is, is matter that's not visible um, uh, to their instrumentation or to the naked eye. It doesn't respond to light, right? So most particles that we're aware of respond to light in some form, so you can actually measure them or see them visibly somehow with some kind of detector. Dark matter is not like that. So visible matter, according to their estimates, accounts for 4% of the makeup of our universe, whereas dark matter, as well as dark energy, so matter that we can't see and the energy that we can't see, makes up a whopping 96% of our universe, according to physicists. And so... Um, there's the graphic for that. You can see, I, you probably can't see it, but in any event, it's dark energy, 73%, dark matter, 23%, and then ordinary matter making up only 4%. That's interesting to read about. Um, so we'll move on. Uh, the first confirmation that Einstein's theory of relativity was correct was that he could use it to accurately predict Mercury's orbit. So little pieces of trivia like that are kind of kind of cool to have in the back of your head. You throw them back in there, and then it gives you something to 
to reference once in a while. Some of it is is it is 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 simply trivia, but some of it, as I said, it does slowly give you a little bit of a better grip on the entire cosmos of of to the extent that physicists are able to understand up until today or up until ten years ago when this book was was uh, published. And they're talking a little different ways that they measure um, light from distant locations. Very interesting stuff. And um, then we move on to chapter 21, Visitors from the Dark Side. And they're searching for dark matter. And it, it talks about the three major ways that they're looking for uh, dark matter or particles, as I said, that are obviously extremely difficult to detect. It can only detect uh, the residual of them, like when they decay or when they bounce off something else. So they have um, detectors out in space, like on satellites. They have these deep underground detectors. And of course, they have the um, Large Hadron Collider, um, which is also being used to search for dark matter. So chapter 21 is kind of cool, talking about all that transparent matter that they're hoping to discover and maybe even discover it in, in um, other dimensions of which we're not aware and very interesting stuff. So then we go on to the final part, part six, which is called the Roundup and chapter 22, which is called Think Globally and Act Locally. And this chapter is an interesting chapter because it's just um, talking about the necessity for patience, perseverance, you know, practice. It's kind of um, pumping up the idea of the need to work hard to achieve something. And so it's kind of a, a pat on the back for scientists, right? And she keeps talking about uh, when we developed this theory, when we did this, when we did that. She's in referring to Raman Sundram. She says, when Raman Sundram and I worked on supersymmetry, she won this big award for developing a theory about supersymmetry and uh, developing a theory about uh, uh, the possibility of uh, a curved uh, dimension of space that is outside of the three dimensions and maybe responds to gravity di differently. And apparently this uh, contributed to the knowledge of reality, and so she won a big award for it. But it sounds to me like this was likely developed by Raman Sundram. And because of the position that she's in, this guy comes to her and says, hey, I've got this pretty cool idea, but I'm a nobody. And you've got this big pedigree. How about we partner together and see if we can publish this for some exposure because it looks like some pretty interesting results that I've developed. I'm just speculating. I'm spitballing here. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. But this is what it sounds like when she keeps saying, we developed this, we developed that. And she's, you know, co-opting his discoveries, um, but she's not here to defend herself. So I, I, I just highly doubt that she came up with it herself. So she's taking credit for it. And her part is the marketing and the connections amongst the intellectual elites to which she is a member, of course. And so she can bring uh, that discovery to light. And they both, it's a win-win for both of them on and so on and so forth. I'm just thinking out loud. With all due disrespect to the author, I'm sure she's contributed many wonderful things and she's done many wonderful talks. So I, I, I don't want to be too harsh and, and speculate too much. Uh, thinking outside the box, she talks about that think outside the box experience, which is important to do. And then we come to the conclusion. And the conclusion is quite interesting because she doesn't leave the reader without taking one last swipe at Christianity and She's talking about how it's important for these small groups of inspired individuals who should be in control of technology. And she goes on to say that technology is the greatest power. And because science develops technology, then science is responsible for the greatest power for humanity, to benefit humanity. And, and Christians could basically just be associated with anti-intellectualism and extremist views. And even though not all religions act that way, she does point out the traditional Christian heritage and guilt by association, right? This is the problem that, that really irks me, that the author goes out of her way to smear 
the Christian religion, when really the Christian religion is an individual religion. It's not, you know, do this and do that and no. It speaks to each person individually. The teacher told, you know, one person, you follow me. Another person says, you don't follow me. You go back and tell you what good things God has done for you. That's why I want to make these videos. I want to tell whoever's watching this that God has done good things for me in spite of what I deserve. You got a wide range of different people that come to Christianity for different reasons. My life partner, she's the typical Christian that is good to start with. You know what I mean? The salt of the earth. There's other people that are a little bit, um, yeah, you know, they could end up on a, a news report for somebody that runs amok and goes a little bit bonkers. I fall into that category. I became Christian because I need to be a Christian. You know, Justin Trudeau said, oh, evangelical Christians are some of the worst people in the world. Well, some of them are. But the fact is they realize that they are, that they do need a savior. And this is why they become Christian. That doesn't automatically mean they turn into saints. Far from it. That's an ongoing struggle. You know, take up your cross and follow me. I have to take up my cross every day so that I don't run amok, so that I don't turn into a psychopath, right? I want to be a better person, and Christianity gives me that beacon of light knowing that God deals with me as an individual. What he expects of me is not what he's going to expect from Mother Teresa. It says to one who's been given many talents, more is expected of them, and one who's only got a couple of talents, only a few are expected of them. You know, in my last video, I came up with some different radical ideas for Christianity, ecumenicalism, and things like that. And some people will see that and say, oh, he's not saved. He's a, he's a false teacher. He's a, he's a this, that. And Christians are perfect at that. Christians love to exclude other people from being Christians. They'll say, oh, he can't be a Christian because he's this. Oh, he can't be. Oh, he's got tattoos. He's, he's not saved, right? Anybody that's not saved, they exclude out of their circle of awareness and they like to be the only person that's saved in the entire world. Them and, of course, their very, very close friends and exclude everybody else. And this is common for other religions, too. The Jews say, well, anybody who's a non-Jew, they're, they're, they're idolatry. The Christians are, are worshiping a man as, as God and they're, they're in idolatry. The Muslims are looking at Christians and saying, oh, they're not accepting our prophet. They're, they're, in, in, they're apostate. Just, you know what I mean? Every religion does the same thing. They all point to the other and say, ah, oh, you're not worshiping God the right way. Doesn't that ring a little bit weird to you that we're all trying to worship the God who created heaven and earth? But we look at the other person and say, oh, no, he said, you know, the scripture tells us that God is able to make him stand. Why do you judge someone who's trying to worship your heavenly father in a way that's different from you? So this idea of Christianity being the enemy of science is absolutely, absolutely from a way of thinking which is characterized by ignorance and stereotypical labeling of Christians as being this way. Oh, Christians are anti-science because they believe in creation or they believe in the six days of creation. Christians are anti-science because they used to think that the earth was the center of the earth. Well, not all Christians believe that all the time, right? It was the Christians that originally broke out of that mold. So what are you talking about, Lisa Randall? For her, the history of humanity only goes back to the 1600s and 1700s. When Galileo arrived on the scene or Sir Isaac Newton arrived on the scene, that's when she feels that the history of humanity started because that's when, when real science started. Well, hey, I hate to tell you, Lisa, but those guys were Christians. Those guys were Christians, okay? And they said, hey, wait a minute. Let's try and understand this magnificent creation that God has made for us. And Christians have developed many, many great... Have they had struggles against the hierarchy of the ruling Politburo of the church at the time? Absolutely, of course they did. Because when you try and put all Christians into one group, you get corruption. You get corruption within large organizations. That's the, the state of humanity. No wonder Christianity is not supposed to be a state-sponsored religion. It's not supposed to be, you know, he said, his kingdom is not of this world. So you persevere until he comes. You, you follow God and he'll show you how to live your life. He will show you what to be responsible for in your life. It's an individual-based religion. It's not a corporate religion. It's not this denomination or that denomination or this is better, that's better. It isn't. The Pentecostals try and think that, oh, it's 
we're, we're the right ones because we have Azusa Street or we have the, 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 the fruits of the Spirit. Well, that's good for you. I'm glad you got the fruits of the Spirit. That's wonderful. But did you know that Scripture teaches purgatory? It's in your own Scriptures. It says the one who didn't know what to do was ignorant. He'll get a few stripes. But the one who knew God's will and didn't do it, he's going to get many stripes. He says, you won't get out of there until you've paid the last cent. That's teaching purgatory. But then they put down the Catholics for teaching purgatory. Oh, no, that's not right. You can't pray for the dead. You can't do that. It's just one small example. There's many, many examples like that because Scripture talks to individuals in different ways. For some people, they'll have a piece of Scripture that really speaks to them. And for other people, they'll read it and just it just goes in and out of their mind like it doesn't mean anything. That's, the, that's the, the beauty and the wonderfulness of how much God loves us that he can speak to us through Scripture on an individual basis. <clears throat> Look at the last instructions he gave to those two apostles, right? When Peter's going, what about this guy? What about, what about that guy? And he's saying, what do, what do you care if I want him to remain till I come again? You follow me. That was his last instructions. His, his last instructions were, don't worry about what other people are doing. You follow me, and I'll speak to you, and I'll guide you. I'll, I'll guide you in the way you should go. And God has done that for me, absolutely, 100%. I'm not living in the circumstances that I'm living had it not been for the mercy and the grace of God. You know, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I confess him as Lord. I, I'm willing to, to read the Apostles' Creed or whatever it means. So if someone points at me and says, oh, you're, you're not a Christian because you believe this or you said that, sue me. I'm not responsible to you. I'm responsible to my Heavenly Father, God, who revealed himself to me through that wonderful teacher, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who came and suffered and died so that my sins could be covered, right? I believe that 100%. But other people will have their own specific details about their own salvation, and when we extrapolate that out, who do we to say about the 99? Even when Jesus' apostles saw people say, hey, we saw these other guys that were trying to, trying to serve and worship you. Jesus said, leave them alone. Right? No one could speak well with me in one sentence and then try and destroy me in the other. Well, Lisa Randall is, is, is anti-Christian, right? It's not her fault. It's not her fault. She's ignorant. She doesn't know what Christianity is all about. She has no clue. The only thing she associates with Christianity is an anti-science outlook. And that's a, that's a horrible shame. So I got a little bit... But, but you can see how she's promoting the idea of elites controlling science and controlling technology. And she comes right out and says it in the conclusion on page 413, if you want to reference that. And again, 414. Oh, technology is the greatest force in the universe, and science is responsible for that great, for that great force, right? And so she finishes off with that one last dig against Christianity and puffing up her own position that she has, you know, obviously gained the world. But in the process, has she lost her soul? Right? She's at the top. She's at the peak. She's one of the 100, one of the most influential people in, in the world, you could say, in the Western world anyway. And, and um, she's at the peak of her game. You know, she won awards for being a physicist. And she's got, you know, she got her picture at the back. If you see at the back of the sleeve, there's a picture of the author, and she's got her wonderful pedigree, and she could do everything, and she could write an opera. She could do rock climbing. What else does she do? Um, you know, she, she's like, she's won the world. She has the world by the seat of her pants. But what's the condition of her soul? You know, <clears throat> Christians are metaphysicists. Christians are dealing with the 96%. That's what I want to study. You know, when I study this, I'm studying the 96%. And the physicists are studying the 4% of what they can see. So who's who's got the last laugh there? Ha, ha, ha. Okay, I'm joking, okay? I'm, I'm being a little silly. But there's a, there's a grain of truth to what I'm talking about, right? You spend all your life studying the 4%, and you get all these accolades, and you get all this attention and glory. And that's great. That's wonderful. I'm studying the 96%. And I have no accolades. I have no audience, right? I, 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 I get no views on these videos, but I'm happy as a, as, a, as a duck in a pond. 
I am so thankful to have this opportunity to study and try to improve my mind because I've been physically incapacitated because of the, the, the medical condition that I'm suffering. But if but it, it basically channeled me into forcing me to, to doing what I really love to do, which is to read and try and expand my mind and to learn about my reality and, and the things around me. So if you have a book that you'd like me to read, or if you have a topic that you'd like me to comment on, please go ahead and put it in the comments and I'll try and address it. I thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate um, you taking the time out of your busy schedule. And whatever it is that you're working on may be very, very interesting too. So if you got a link to a video that you want to share your ideas, put it in the comment and then I'll, uh, I'll link to your video and um, I'll shout it out and you can shout out my video or something. You know, we could cooperate. But this is what I'm saying. So if you're watching this and, and you happen to be Christian, you're trying to explore the 96%, the invisible energy, the invisible matter that is out there that connects everything and has these minuscule, undetectable, they could be huge forces, but they're undetectable um, from the position that we're in, in this reality such as the case uh, that we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a reality in which we can only perceive a tiny sliver of our reality. And this is what physicists tell us. This is what Albert Einstein already told us 30, 40 years ago, right? That what we can perceive is only a tiny sliver of what is actually out there. And so, um, and again, you know, you look at the scripture I mentioned in my last video, uh, I don't have it here. What was it? Hebrews 11 or something? Hebrews 3.11? Um, you know, the things that are, are made up of the things that are not. What a great summary for our reality. I mean, there's other scriptures you could bring out to, to expound upon that. But that's one that really hits home because it agrees 100% with what they're discovering using these massive particle accelerators, which are, you know, most likely military application-based particle beam stuff that can accelerate stuff through any medium. Imagine having something that you can, you know, shoot beams underwater at any target at any place in the world or through to the other side of the earth, anywhere in the world. Shoot beams of particles that, I mean, yeah, no wonder they get funding for it, right? Or shoot beams from space and who knows what. I mean, I'm not going to speculate. It's never, there's never a, a hint of it in this book at all, at all, at all. But you can't tell me that billions of dollars being cooperatively spent on a project do not have some foundation in military application, unless you're, you know, naive or just want to live a Pollyanna reality. And that's fine, too. I don't want to be too uh, conspiracy theorist oriented because that's that's another, you know, slur that they make on Christians. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, I am a conspiracy theorist because history teaches us there's been a a ton of conspiracies down through the ages. Conspiracies to malign different religions, different groups of people, not just Christians, many different groups of people, right, that are based on conspiracies. So we got to be on our guard against conspiracies because conspiracies are most often nefarious. They can be, I guess, positive conspiracies, but we don't call them conspiracies when they're positive. We call them cooperative efforts at, at you know, Science is, is a conspiracy. They get together and they work together and they say, we're going to solve this problem. Well, we don't call that a conspiracy, do we? We call that a cooperative effort. It's something good. And scientists are working to do good things. You know, they're, they're trying to understand the world and improve technology and improve the life of humanity. And so they're to be commended for that, including the author, Lisa Randall, of course. So sorry for picking on her so much. But you get the idea what I'm trying to say here, right? is that um, I'm, I believe and I want to to somehow contribute to my understanding of the world because I figure if I improve myself and make myself a better person, then I can have a positive impact on my reality. If all I'm going to do is point fingers all day long, then that's probably not a good way to spend my time. So I want to work on improving myself. I want to read more to improve my mind and my understanding so that I can be more sympathetic to, to the world around me and um, hopefully be more useful to my creator uh, for what he's blessed me with so that I can be a blessing to others. Does that make sense? I hope it does.
Thank you again for watching. God bless you. Let's wrap that up. That's the last video in this five-part series on this particular book. I'm very thankful for finding that book in a, in a thrift, thrift shop here locally. And I'm going to be on the lookout for my next book. Uh, I'm currently finishing off a book by Noam Chomsky, which is an indictment on U.S. foreign policy. It's called Hegemony or Survival. I might just make like one video on that. It's, it's very dark and depressing, and it's kind of like something uh, we already know that occurs in the world, but it, it just repeats and repeats and repeats all the instances of, I'll leave it for another video, but I, I, I won't go on and on about it. I might just make like one video about it. Um, but beyond that, I'll be on the lookout for my next book and I'll be trusting God for his direction in making some more videos that hopefully maybe I can make some that are more encouraging oriented instead of being so critical. Okay. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you. God loves you. I love you. I hope you have a fantastic day wherever you are. Enjoy the wonderful weather. It's summertime here when I'm making this video. Whenever you're watching this, I hope you get a chance to enjoy nature, breathe in the fresh air that we have provided by our loving creator who loves us so much that he cares about everything that we do. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye.